I'm excited. Coming up, we've got a I've got a big interview with Todd Kearns. Todd Kearns. This is his solo vinyl right here, Borrowing Trouble, which is an amazing album right there. This one is really neat because it's a lot of acoustic stuff. Um, because he is very much the age of electric are uh, they're a little bit more pop rock, I would say. Age of Electric are pop rock uh, band. This one was re-released in 2017. Um, super awesome album. This they have a song on here. Uh, what is it? Remote Control, first track on the uh, album. That was also when I mentioned to it to different people, they automatically know it from Big Shiny Tunes too. I think it was. Um, yeah, uh, which is probably one of the biggest big shiny tunes there was. Anyway, um, yeah, I, it, it, I, this one's exciting to me because out of all the artists that we've uh, that I've interviewed, I've probably seen Todd Kearns the most out of any of them throughout the years. Like I, I have seen Todd Kearns play at little places in uh, some little bar in Cambridge. Uh, which was a super cool show, terrible bar, but super cool show. Uh, I've seen him play a whole ton of different University of Waterloo um, shows. I've seen him play huge shows at the Danforth Music Hall with Age of Electric. Age of Electric always was the headliners for a bunch of years there for the headlining of the side stage at Edgefest. And I always felt bad for the main band, the, the band that was on the main stage, because no one would be over watching them. They'd all be over watching the Age of Electric. Um, and then and then he ends up becoming the bass player for Slash and singing the Guns N' Roses parts of Guns N' Roses, uh, Axl Rose's parts on the Guns N' Roses songs. And he performed here at uh, maybe some of you were at it a few years back. Um, big music fest in Kitchener at the old uh, that park that they put a hill over the dump and um, amazing set even there. So I'm sure we'll get into a whole bunch of that. I'm I'm super excited for this interview. I've met Todd Kearns a bunch of times. He performed one show I saw. Uh, was like a, a frosh week show when I was at the University of Waterloo and I ended up just staying in Fed Hall once they were kicking everyone out and I probably at the time had long hair uh, long black hair like Todd Kearns and so they maybe just thought I was with the band and then I ended up staying in there and hanging out with the Age of Electric and another time I wore this shirt to a Static and Stereo concert. We ended up going backstage and hanging out with them uh, back backstage at Static and Stereo. Static and Stereo is another top. He's been in so many bands. I'll try and name a bunch of them off at the beginning. Anyway, I doubt that he'll even remember any of that with him now performing with Slash and touring all over the world. But uh, you never know. And yeah. I'm excited for it. Anyways, I'm going to pause it. I'm way early. He's not going to be coming in anytime soon. Go. Hello? Can you hear me now? There we go. Yeah. Can you? Okay, hang on a second. I've never used this particular no? format. There we go. There it is. Boom. How are you, brother? Good. How are you doing? Not bad at all. There this we go. Fall here, so. <laughs> what do you use? Because you do a lot of. I see that you're interviewing a lot of people. What? Uh... Um, Zoom, Streamyard. Whatever works. Whoa, look at the that's a, a classic 97, 98 t-shirt right there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Man, oh man. The, uh, my age of electric shirt on for the interview. Yeah. That's a classic, man. I don't even have one of those, I don't think. They, they used to make them in like these crazy orange colors. And I'm like, who the hell's gonna buy an orange t-shirt? But that's what they decided. 
it was the I 90s know. so things were kind of uh i'm sorry this is kind of wacky here i'm gonna unplug this um things were wacky yeah there we go <clears throat> um so uh, i i i should let you know oh i think there we go um i should let you know i already hit record because uh okay with one of my other interviews as soon as the person jumped in, we started talking and stuff like that. And I was thinking, oh, hang on a sec. I got to hit record. So I just already. <laughs> I do that I all the time. Before. It's like the whole conversation goes on. And then you're kind of like, man, I should be recording this. Uh, hang on a second. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. The most interesting stuff is happening before you even start recording. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I, I'm going to go through, I'm mainly going to focus on uh, guitar and your relationship with the guitar. I'm in a weird situation where I love playing guitar. I've got a bunch of guitars and I play mm -hmm. a lot, but uh, our guitar teacher left. And now that because I've attended my school meetings in, in this, they asked me to be the guitar teacher. So it sounds fun, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> sounds like a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, especially after some of these interviews with with, I, with some of the things that people are saying that they do on guitar, and I'm thinking, I've never heard of that before. I don't know what you're talking about. So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's learning for me as well. Um, I'm going to, okay, I had to write all these down, and I'm sure I missed a bunch too, but we've got Age of Electric, Static in Stereo, uh, Todd Kern's solo stuff, Two, yeah. Sin City Sinners, uh, bass and vocals for Slash. I, yeah. I believe you did some background vocals. I could be wrong. This is all from memory. On Mac Good's album? I did on on Undergrounds and on Beautiful Midnight. Yeah, so both those records. There's oh, okay. two songs on each record that I sang harmonies on. We just happened to be like neighbors, and he would be like, Hey, I got this song and I'd be like, okay. And then next thing I know, I'm singing on, you know, basically just the higher stuff that, that they didn't want to attempt. <laughs> I don't blame them. That always sort of falls on me. Cool. And you were, I think you were in his video for one of, for some yeah. song. I was in the video for Rico, I think it's called. Yeah. It's okay. on the Underground's record. Yeah. It was, uh, we, we toured together. I did like a whole, um, acoustic run just opening for the matthew good band back in those days yeah nice um i'm still not even done bc hall of fame juno nominations like all this stuff uh how, where did you how did you get started in music and specifically how did you get going on guitar to and and you're not done like that's the career so far well <laughs> yeah exactly in a lot of ways, it sounds so exhausting. I'm kind of like, I should just stop. I should just stop now. Um, it, uh, I think it was an obsession very early on. You know, I think it was like, um, you know, when people talk about when I grow up, I'm going to be a, a cowboy or an astronaut or a fireman or whatever. And I was just always like, just obsessed with music, you know, and obsessed before I could even, before I touched an instrument. You know, my father had a, an acoustic, um, an old harmony F hold uh, just was around the house. He'd bust it out on occasion and play a few cowboy songs or whatever. But we, uh, um, you know, it was like digging through their records and finding the Beatles and all that stuff that really kind of got me super psyched. And then Kiss and all that stuff that kind of started to happen. Um, and then we just, you know, I just picked up the guitar. Went, I think I was running around the house pretending I was Elvis or something like that. And he was like, no, 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 give me that. And he showed me like C, G and D or something like that. And he goes there now, you know, three chords and and, um, you know, some guitar lessons that were largely painful because it's interesting hearing you talk about having to teach guitar because it was so much, you know, campfire songs and, you know, just kind of like and you're wanting to play like, can we play, you know, I don't know, like just smoke in the water, anything you know, like rock and roll songs. Um, but I mean, there's so much of that kind of stuff where you just you want to get the fundamentals down before you kind of move forward and for me it just i never put it down like I, I was really into art i used to paint and draw when i was a kid and just walked away you know my parents had big dreams of sending me to art school and picked up a guitar and that was all over you know what i mean hmm. so what was 
you were saying Kiss, w would that be what you started playing? And would you have started right on an acoustic or right to an electric? It was definitely acoustic. I My father bought me a, an Epiphone, it was called an Epi, which was like an affordable Epiphone. Um, and I, I played that thing all the time. So so bands like a lot of the, uh, you know, the four major food groups of British rock, like the Beatles and the Stones and the Who and stuff like that were the bands that I was really into. Um, the Who, for whatever reason, was the band that really kind of connected with me as far as thinking that there was something I could actually pursue because the Beatles seemed like they were from the great beyond and Kiss were superheroes. You know what I mean? It was, they didn't seem like career choices. You know, it seemed like Elvis seemed like from Valhalla, you know, it didn't, none of that made sense until I saw the kids are all right movie, which was a film they put out. Um, I think around 80, I'm not sure. And I think I was already strumming the guitar and kind of noodling around, but um, that was when I kind of felt like it sort of turned me into the, the punk rock lane where where the whole attitude of like we have to be able to play yes or play you know very technical minded kind of music it sort of became like no we can literally like take three chords and go into somebody's garage and just make a terrible racket and uh and we did <laughs> i'm still doing that frankly three chords and terrible racket but uh yeah, I, it, it just sort of, you know, that kind of stuff, like getting into like the Ramones and that kind of stuff was sort of like, OK, well, you know, we, we just kind of get up and running and and you get into a three chord, 12 bar kind of thing and you can sort of almost play anything. And then you kind of you're, you, as you can start to do that, you start to up your game. You know, I was like 13, 14 years old when I when I the other part of the story is that my father, in his wisdom, somehow decided well you have a guitar let's get you a bass guitar and i was like okay so we, i bought this what well, he bought this gibson eb3 um sg bass and uh you know then i was like this kid and just in junior high and the guys in uh well actually everybody was out of school except the drummer was in in 12th grade grade 12 and um and they were like we need a bass player. And I'm like, I could, I could barely play. Like I was still kind of like going, you know, just playing through the chords or whatnot. But, and they were very sort of like, no, 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 dude, it's easy or not easy, but it's like, we'll get you into it. And I, and I, and I, I jumped in and started playing with these guys and, and just being able to play with other people, especially people who are that much better than me or that much more experienced than me. Just, you, you just, you just, uh, progress, you progress so much faster than you would just sitting in your basement. So, you know, and that's where a lot of people are always kind of like, because I have a whole chapter of my career now as a bass player. And I was like, well, I kind of started on bass. Like I, I played bass all the way up until Age of Electric. I, I was a bass player. Um, my brother picked up the bass in my absence and uh, was way better than me. Still is way better than me. And then, uh, you know, then I moved over to guitar and, and just singing because um, we wanted to put a band together. But uh, yeah, so it's one of those things. I, I really... I always consider myself a street fighter when it comes to music. Like I, I never really went to school per se. I don't know how to read music. I I've learned so much of it along the way. When I talk about the major third or the minor third or the fifth or the, I know exactly what we're talking about, but I don't know it from, um, I only know it in a practical sense of doing it all these years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you jumped into it even when you were saying it. Uh, another question I was going to ask is, a lot of the time people have performance anxiety for jumping on. And I'm sure you get some nervousness or anxiety. I mean, I saw you uh, play with the Age of Electric for years, Static and Stereo, up to huge shows at like big, big uh, music fest in Kitchener. Yeah. That was just thousands with, yeah. uh, with Slash. Is there like... A lot of the time they have anxiety to just jump into it and start performing. But it sounds like that's what you did with the bass. You just had this confidence to be able to do it. I, I guess there's a certain amount of confidence and a certain amount of like, it's almost make believe. Like you, you think about like pretending to be a cowboy or pretending to be, you know, whatever games you play when you're a kid. I'll be Luke Skywalker, you know, whatever the hell you're doing. And I think a certain amount of that became kind of like, I can't wait to get on stage and jump around like an idiot because I love watching guys play guitar and jump around like an idiot. And 
it just was it was just fun to me. I understand the idea of standing up on stage um, in front of people. Like the idea of public speaking is no one's favorite thing. You know what I mean? Um, I think it was also the case of being the bass player. You know, we had a singer and that kind of thing. So I was kind of, you know, just another guy in the back. And it was just kind of fun to play. Um, there wasn't really that feeling of like, you're going to forget all the words. You you have to talk to the audience between songs. It was just sort of like, I just get up and play and have fun behind my friends or with my friends, but behind the singer. And um, yeah, so I don't really, I mean, there are, I would, anxiety is a good word for it. There's a sort of like getting in the ring kind of thing. You know, you want to, you just can't wait to get on stage. And sometimes that creates this sort of feeling of like um, an anxiousness, but it's not really a negative thing to me. It's never been something I'm loathing. And I have plenty of friends who, who still struggle with like, even Slash has told me he gets nervous. Um, I don't know if I should be divulging that, but I think it's, you know, it, it's different. It's not, it's not like a, you know, he's in the fetal position crying. It's more just a case of, you know, regular uneasiness about getting ready to go out in front of people, play. What if my pedal doesn't work? What if the cable goes, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think that that's, those are the kind of things that I've always been very comfortable with. I have no control over that anyway. Strings are going to break. Um, you know, I'm going to forget words. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just. If you have a, if you get off stage and you get an A plus plus plus, then great. But the chances are you're going to come off stage and every musician grades themselves on a very difficult curve anyway. And I'm always like, Ugh. I've kind of learned that it's not about me anymore. It's about them. It's about the audience. And did they have fun? Did they enjoy themselves? That's all that matters. Yeah, I, I feel like you're really amazing. And even more uh, aside from just performing the instruments like the interaction with the crowd is something huge that uh, you bring to all the bands that you you perform with so that's well again it's, it's it's part of the fun you know what i mean like the whole idea of playing music to me is just i, I still to this day feel you know except for the last almost year now <laughs> not having been yeah. off stage but i still feel very you know fortunate that we that i get to do it you know that we get to do this and stand up here and play in front of people and and, you know, they've had a crazy week at work and they get to just stand here and or rock out with with us. And I, that's never lost on me how important that is. And so sort of interacting with the audience and making hopefully having some kind of connection and making some kind of impact, hopefully, you know, that's that's the whole goal. So hopefully they go home and they they had a great time and, and they you, you hopefully made some kind of memory for them. That's that's a positive one. That's how I feel. Yeah. Um. When I was learning, I would say that probably you and your brother John were one of the uh, one of the things that hindered a little bit of my working or my guitar playing because I always saw you guys performing and you look so cool <laughs> and your guitars were way down at your knees and so yeah. I wanted my guitar way down at my knees too and so I had to tape together two guitar straps in order to get it that long. And would have my good, but then I could hardly play. So when did it evolve to, have, like, did you start out playing so low, or did I always? I, I well, when I was a kid, not really, because I don't think they made guitar straps like that. But I think that um, eventually it just became really normal to have my guitar. I got you know orangutan arms, and uh, I was always sort of a rhythm guitar player in a way. So I was kind of living around the seventh fret was as high as I was going to get, you know. <laughs> In that world, you know, Paul Stanley, uh, Jimmy Page, the Ramones, you know, all those guys, it's th it's their fault. I just said that's what it looks like to put a guitar on. You know, I mean, I certainly had seen all those guys like when you look at the Beatles now and their guitars are like way up here, like a necktie. Um, but I yeah. guess I just kind of gravitated towards those guys and I just thought that looked cool. John's my brother's was ridiculous. It just got longer and longer to the point where he was actually leaning over to play the damn thing. So that's not advisable. <laughs> uh, the fact that he doesn't have major back problems is surprising to me. But, um, you know, it, for John, it just became kind of like it just became kind of part of his thing to be that extreme with it. You know what I mean? Um, Ryan's guitar was really low originally, too. Like we were kind of like from that world. But um, it, it's a funny thing because it's it does hinder your playing. You have to, you know, it depends on what kind of music you're playing. I don't think a lot of you know, Eddie Van Halen types, their, their guitars are usually fairly, you know, high ish, you know, but that's not how I play <laughs> still. Actually, it's still pretty damn low. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm thinking 
I, I'm noticing as you're talking in the background there, it, it, yeah. you just said Eddie Van Halen. Is that that's an Eddie Van Halen guitar up there, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I picked it up somewhere along the line. I made a whole series of these. Uh, oh, they're continuing to make a series of these for the EVH company, and I had to have that one. I was like, this is years ago too. I mean, like it's it's been highly forefronted now because since Ed passed. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's a. Uh, it's a big deal. So that was never my thing. Cause right beside that, you see, that's a Johnny Ramon guitar. <laughs> Which is a, uh -huh. And then you get some kiss guitars and stuff. So, uh, I never really, I always gravitated towards Rick Nielsen from cheap trick and the New York dolls. And I just loved like that kind of, you know, scrappy rock and roll. So the technical stuff, I always loved it. I was appreciated, but I had just had no interest in playing like that, which is weird because, you would think it'd be the kind of thing where you go, I want to do that. But I just just didn't really speak to me that way. I always really appreciate it. And I still really appreciate uh, um, those kind of players. But I just kind of like, I just knew it wasn't for me. I just kind of like, so there's got to be not, you don't want everybody to be the same. You have to have some, yep. have some change, some differences all the way. Definitely. Um, so with that, when you go into, actually, this is probably a better transition. We just talked about these custom guitars. You've got your own custom guitar. Uh, I do. Uh, which is, well, actually a couple of them because there's a bass and a guitar series for. Yeah. Each. Yeah. And so how does, uh, like, I, I, I guess the damn it series kind of came as a clothing type thing first and then yeah, transitioned into the, to the yeah. guitar. The damn it thing is, it's such a funny thing because, you know, as a kid, because Todd damn it rhymes with the expletive of, of GD, it <laughs> was an old punk rock thing to take your name and, and attach Johnny Rotten, Sid Vicious, you know, just attach some kind of funny thing to it. And that was just, a, you know, Todd Zilla. It, it, they, they, you know. Everybody's so damn clever. And then when I came to when I came to America, because I'd had a whole career in, in Canada, as is your you're wearing one of the shirts. Um, so I I just found myself. I never moved, and that's the funniest thing about it is I still don't really feel that I moved. I just feel like the planet got bigger. You know, I mean, like home became many places. But um, I came to the states and uh, started doing a bunch of stuff and. Um, the, the most interesting thing about that was that no one knew who no one knew who Todd Kearns was. You know what I mean? In a way, everything that you get to kind of go out and do something with your whole resume, just kind of that's the guy that did this and did that and did this. Down here, none of that stuff had any impact because Canada, um, you know, it's a totally different story. You know what I mean? Um, and then the Todd Dammit thing really caught on, which was really funny because um, Vinnie Paul from Pantera, who we've since lost. He was out here. He loved calling me Todd. He would scream Todd Dammit across casinos. And I'd be like, oh, Vinny's here. And and it became like a thing. And, and then um, we made a T-shirt. Um, my friend made a T-shirt for me. It just says Damn It. And we did a DVD with Slash in 2011. And then people started going, where can I get that Damn It T-shirt? And we're like, this is the T-shirt. This is the only, you know, this is the only one. Um, so then we did a run of those and then it kind of grew and grew. And then, you know, now it's kind of its own thing. And there's a company out of Toronto that makes a, a, a very beautiful brand of it as well. So we've licensed it a number of places. And then with the guitars, um, was a totally different thing because, um, a relationship that I had with prestige guitars out of Vancouver, I've known those guys, I want to say 20 years, probably, um, just from, the Vancouver scene and uh, and and Mike, who who started the company, you know, we always sort of he would always bounce ideas off me, and and I was always a big fan of what he was doing. So I had always played their stuff all, all through the years, and then in around I want to say 2016, I think it was, we started talking about doing a, a signature model. Because I was playing a lot of different stuff, and, and what, especially as, as a bass player. And I think once you've been on stage as much as I have, you play, if you play multiple different models, there are things about this particular guitar that I really love, but I don't like this thing about it. But there's the other things about this one that I really love, but I don't like that. You know, not that I don't like it, but it just in a, in a live situation with someone like Slash, everything's so streamlined and so... Um, uh, like, like for us, it's like 
for me, what I do in my gig in the slash thing, it's not about like, and then I have a fretless and then there's a, you know, it's like, it's not, there's not like, it's, it's sort of, you get on stage and you go, you know, it's like, there's sort of like, that's your, and I, one thing I learned from slash was having his sound, you know what I mean? Like he has a sound, it's an identifiable sound. And that's kind of what I wanted to do when I, when I got into the bass thing was sort of like developing, this is the sound. So the, the, the signature bass is literally one volume knob. I don't use any tone controls because I figure I'm always that guy. I can control the tone within the amp or wherever I'm using. Um, I don't find, I never found myself adjusting a lot of tone while I was playing bass guitar slash does it all the time. Um, and so it's literally one volume control and a, and a kill switch is what I have on stage because when you're playing in front of, you know, gazillions of people, there's nothing worse than your guitar ringing out when it's not supposed to be or, or between songs. I've always been like my whole life. I came up playing my Les Paul where my, my neck pickup was always off. Like I would just turn down my, my neck volume. So I was always constantly shutting myself off just because it became like a professional thing of like, just knowing when to mute yourself essentially. Cause nothing drives me crazier than when you're like trying to talk and the guitar player is just ringing out because he doesn't turn his guitar. It's like, you know, that's just kind of like a, a million years of doing this but um so uh yeah so i just have a kill switch on it. the guitar is totally different the guitar is you know it's got a jb in the front 59 and uh and it's got tone volume tone volume for both uh it's, it's, it's got a, a, a tone that runs both pickups and then uh two volumes for each pickup so so it's a lot more um uh what's the word you could, it's more conventional in that sense. We 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 won a, a platinum award from Guitar World magazine in 2017 from doing the the Nam, uh, the Nam show that year in Anaheim. So it was really exciting. I mean, it was framed on my wall. It's you know, it's like it's one of those things where you're like, I was a guy like when you know everybody was obsessing about you know motocross bikes or bmx bikes or skateboarding i was just all about guitars i would just sit there and drool over guitar world and guitar magazines and then to have guitar world you know acknowledge this guitar was like like it just blew my mind i mean well, so and that's been going on for i did the last slash tour with nothing but my anti-star bases so um it'll be exciting to try and get back out there again because it's a you know, it's an ongoing relationship that we've had for years. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and they yeah. look so cool, too, with the with the star. Uh, did you come? Did you like design the look of them? Yeah. Yeah, it has. It's the it's a, you know, it's sort of an, an offset. You know, it has elements of like um, Jazz Master or Jaguar, but it also has, you know, but it's more sort of in the Thunderbird firebird kind of it has a non-reverse and a reverse thunderbird if you're familiar with what the non-reverse and 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 reverse firebirds or thunderbirds um the thunderbirds uh, gibson thunderbird and firebird guitars that we know today are technically what they call reverse because they originally came out with the bodies um a mirror image of that that weren't quite as popular and then when they reversed the image they became popular so I like the tail end. I wish I had one here. They're all out in different places, but the tail end has a a, a, a reverse style, and then the the top end is more of like a non reverse. So it's kind of this weird amalgamation of I'm I'm a giant, so I love. I got a Les Paul Junior sitting right there. My favorite guitars are like Les Paul Juniors and stuff, but they look so dorky on me. Like they look like ukuleles because I'm you know I'm six four and long arms and. So generally, the the bigger the instrument, the better it looks on me. I feel, you know. So that's why like sometimes basses look correct on me. <laughs> so, so it's long. It's got a reverse headstock, which is a whole other, a whole other conversation. Uh, what's uh, Richard Fortas from Guns and Roses and I go on? He goes in this huge rabbit hole about the tension on a on a on a on a reverse headstock, how much better it is. And I'm like, oh, I just thought it looked cool. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Cool. Now, it, like when when you're this, this has got to be so weird to me because you were saying in uh, with, like those bands like Kiss and Beatles were were just kind of out there. They weren't like real or attainable. And I right, feel like right. I feel like that's the same thing. You're, I can say the exact same thing about Guns N' Roses. Like they're almost not even a real band. They're like these yeah. magical robots that make music. And I so know. 
what would it like how would it you going into a room and slash is there and and okay let's play let's let's play some songs together that like, was surreal it was surreal only in that you know i've been doing this a long time i played with a lot of cool people and um you know so people like when i first came to vegas or eventually when i was in vegas we put together a band sin city sinners and we were largely built on the idea of whoever's coming through town let's just jam with them so george lynch from Dawkins and sylvain sylvain who just passed away unfortunately from uh, new york dolls or cheetah chrome from the dead boys and slim jim phantom from that's what that upright bass is about i, I picked up an upright bass to play with slim jim phantom from the stray cats wow. so you know all these kind of things that you know all these guys would roll through town and to me they all fit into this giant catalog of of people that i loved and that i really looked up to as a kid and um dave ellison from megadeth you know all these kind of guys that i, I really always looked up to so getting to play with slash was it was sort of next level but it kind of didn't feel that unusual in and of itself the age of electric met slash in 91 just randomly at the rainbow one night he was just like the friendliest guy in la for some reason and uh you know that's he has no recollection of that. We were just some jackasses hanging out in a in a restaurant. <laughs> um, but yeah, so getting to kind of step in there with him, it, it's it's like they say about that sort of ten thousand hours thing, where you kind of have preparation, you know, with opportunity, you know, kind of equals success, I suppose. In that, I felt more than qualified for the gig, you know, as far as like, you know, I didn't. I, I always tell the story. It wasn't really arrogant because I, I kind of more like just it was so randomly like come down and jam and I just came down and jam. I didn't really have a lot of time to go over any music or anything like that. I just kind of showed up, played through Night Train, and that was it. You know, it was like yeah, it was it was initially um, mildly intimidating, but you know, it, it's funny because when I think of what I how you know what I thought of the situation in the moment, and then the guy I got to know, it's. It's it's so funny how different it is because such an easygoing guy and such a very um, kind hearted guy. Like he's very sort of uh, um, like his expectations would be there as far as music goes. He would want it to be right. He would want it to be great. But um, he would still be patient enough to kind of see you through it. But uh, yeah, no, it was, you know, it, it's similar for me because I was, you know, I can't remember how old I was when that record came out. But when Appetite came out. I was young enough that it had a major impact on me. It's in the DNA, you know what I mean? It's like, it's it's one of those records that's just here. I know every single note of every single song. Um, and the impact that that band had on the music scene in general, um, they talk about Nevermind. Of course, that in, the impact on, on the grunge thing was massive, but, um, but Appetite had a similar impact because it was really foofy before that. You know, a lot of big hair and a lot of, you know, fanciness going on and guns came in and it was very street and very, you know, very tough and very scrappy and serious. Serious is not the right word, but it was a little bit dangerous, I think is the word. And that sort of changed the game. You know what I mean? So I have nothing but the utmost respect for, for guns and slash would be, yeah, he's like my favorite guitar player. So to walk into the room with him, it was kind of like, Again, it was it was an interesting to, it, it, interesting to set, take that step back into being the bass player because it was sort of like I could do this, but this is this is what I do. I, I can do this with my with my eyes closed to some degree. You know, not not an arrogant thing, but just sort of feeling like this is what I do. It's like if I asked you know the plumber to come over here and fix the the, the, the pipes, he can do that. That's what he does. You know, what I mean, it's I can't do that. I should have his eight by ten on my wall. <laughs> but you know it's it's one of those things where you just feel you know a confidence knowing that yeah I, I know how to do this this is what i do so you just show up and you, you do your gig and it's different when it's a cattle call of auditions i was literally like they had somebody and it wasn't working out and i walked in and it was sort of like we're doing the jay leno show next week that was 11 years ago that'll be 11 years in march like next month wow. it'll be 11 years so it's it's mind blowing how fast this happens, you know. It's crazy. Yeah, it it, it is cuz I was even just thinking as I was here getting ready for this, I was grabbing my vinyl that I had and I was grabbing the Make a Pest a Pet uh re-release vinyl and yeah. I was thinking, that was like 3 years ago or something. I know. The, the 
uh, something yeah, like that. And, almost four because it was 2017 because it was the 20th anniversary of Make a Pesta Pet was the 1997. Yeah, so yeah, it's so, crazy, and it which is like what that, that shirt is from that tour. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The and original tour, not the 2017 tour, the 1997, right. 98 tour. Yeah, that's right. I wouldn't have broken it, uh, cut it all this messed up in just three or four years. This is, this is... <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's literally <laughs> twenty some years of it now. Yeah, yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. What's What's neat is I told my principals too that I was doing. Well, I, I mentioned all all the uh, people that I was interviewing. And uh, I said your name and they were like, oh, big, shiny tunes, big, shiny tunes too, remote control. So they knew right away. They were all excited about this. You one. know what's funny about that, dude, is that I have a diamond uh, record of that on my wall. And for some reason, I'm the only guy in the age of electric that has that. I, I mean, it's like, no, everybody else is like, I can't get a copy. Of that. I go, huh, what do you mean? You're on the thing. You, you, you should be not just me. I think. A lot of people, I don't remember who who's all on the thing, but other guys have mentioned to me, I didn't get anything for that. And I go, well, I chased it down at some point, and I have it. But it's the biggest selling record that I've ever played on. Big Shiny Tunes 2 was a diamond selling record in, in Canada. Yeah. yeah, I feel like that, that, that was the one of the biggest Big Shiny Tunes there was. It's it's sort of the touchstone. Like a lot of people say that to me, especially people who were like young, like teenagers around that time are like, dude, that record was was a huge deal for them because it wasn't just Canadian bands. It was, I honestly don't even know what the lineup was, but it's, it's, it's an international, um, English, you know, whatever American, everything is on it. So it, it's, it was, it was great to be a part of it because it, it did really well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that is one of the other, uh, one of the other things with just me playing music that was kind of, uh, that came out. We loved remote control so much. We were playing in high school, uh, just like a, a thing. And we thought last minute, well, this is like you said, this is not too hard. It's just about three or four chords. We'll play this. But then we didn't, our, our singer last minute didn't realize the vocal range that you have. And all through the performance and with the with the high school puberty voices going on, <laughs> he's cracking nonstop. And we almost got booed off the stage. It, it, we performed it so terribly. So and well, I apologize. I, that's, <laughs> I take full responsibility for that. <laughs> right. um, but it, it I, I feel like that leads into some of the students' anxiety now. Like we have a video of it that we hide. We don't show that video because it's not a great performance. Um, well, you, but, must, you must share that. <laughs> <laughs> but so many now, like everything's videotaped. Uh, so any little mistake that could lead to some of the anxiety or nervousness. To, That's to a big part. But like we we literally walk off stage with Slash, and I'll sit down. I'll go backstage you know, would get put, hang up a few things and then look at my phone. And what we just did is on YouTube, like already it's, it's bananas. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of taken a lot of it, what kind of sucks about it is it's, you know, like you kind of go through a whole thing of like, you know, hoping that the, the opening song of the show will be exciting. And then, you know, within the first, after you've done the first show, it's like common knowledge. Of, they open with this song, you know, so there's no surprise in that, but just don't screw up. That's the surprise. <laughs> Go on and, you know, but, you know, if you play, you know, say 100 shows, chances are at least one or two of them are going to have some problems, whether it's broken strings or cables or, you know, or forgetting words or falling down, whatever the problems that, that generally can, can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so even going into writing, you get into a room with, I don't know, either Slash or with the Age of Electric crew or by yourself. What are you thinking putting like when, when it comes to I want to put something down? How do I go to start a composition? You know, it's I've been in so many different situations and in so many different equations of, of making stuff work, whether it's in a room full of guys. Age of Electric was largely a room full of guys. We just endless amounts of old tdk 90 tapes just of us jamming nonsense you know and um, a lot of those would turn into songs and we we each had our own ideas as well so um i don't think there's any right way to do it and i and i'm really kind of fascinated by the way different bands do it you know what i mean because um there are bands like u2 or something like that who seem to be largely 
um, organic and that they seem to kind of like play as a band and Bono comes up with melodies and they just turn them into songs. And it's like, wow, magical. And then other, other things are carefully crafted songs, sometimes with outside songwriters. In pop, in the pop world, it's not uncommon to have the artists themselves isn't really uh, involved in the writing. But um, it's, I think it's generally, uh, you know, it seems to be kind of like, for me more now these days, I sort of went down into more of like a a Nashville kind of narrative where I I often think of like, something will just come up in conversation and I'll always think, that's a cool phrase or a cool, you know, couple words that feels like it's sort of like a starting point for something. I've learned that most people who aren't musical per se, I realized that it was a bizarre realization to one day realize people aren't as obsessed with this stuff as I am. But um, the average person, I think, generally reacts to whatever the chorus of the song is. Thunder, thunder you know, whatever it is, you know, whatever song it is. And they're not really too concerned about like, there might be a cool guitar lick, but they don't really sort of have a way of sort of, you know, saying what why that's important to them it just it sounds cool you know um so it literally seems to me like the lyrics themselves and the lyrics and the beat like the, you know people when people would just start moving like when you watch children just naturally dance to music without any provocation at all it's a pretty good indication that music just sort of moves people um that said you know when you start putting the final touches on things and a cool clever chord change and that nice harmony on top or whatever it is but when the actual writing, and I really do believe that if an acoustic guitar and a voice, if the song works like that, you're way ahead of the game. You know what I mean? We live in a different time now where, where, where a lot of things are being built in a computer and, and drums and, and all that. A lot, of, a lot of people are doing stuff in a very sort of, it's either in a very small number of people or in a really large number of people based on that guy's dealing with the drum loop and that guy's dealing with the thing. And, but that guy came up with some lyrics, you know? So sometimes you'll see like six people on a song. You're like, okay, what was, which, what was each of these people's job on this song? Um, but I think honestly, like in this day and age, I, I do, you know, once in a while you come up with a couple of chord changes that you feel like that's cool. And a melody kind of presents itself. I've always equated it to like looking at a, a piece of rock and just started to kind of like chip away at it. till you find, um, something interesting inside of it and uh next thing you know you got a song i mean it, it, you, we learned a lot playing cover songs as kids um you know the intro and there's a verse and then there's some sort of pre-chorus and then there's a chorus and it would just sort of the structure of the song the arrangement would sort of present itself and it was just a matter of kind of like well we can't sing eight days a week so we have to come up with our own words you know or our own songs our own ideas so so we just kind of did that, you know, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it works. Sometimes it's not quite right. I think it's uh, I, I have that sort of like, you know, it's such a it's such a, a mixture of of waiting for lightning to strike and just doing the work. You know what I mean? Like I always sort of bring up this quote I read where Stephen King, the author, talks about when they ask him about his process. No, because you you just assume he's like struck with a crazy idea in the middle of the night. And he just gets up and he, he's got to put it down, which I'm sure happens. But he really made it sound like he wakes up every morning, puts the coffee on, and goes to work. You know what I mean? And I think there's something to be said about that. And I, and I know for myself because I am easily distracted. I love everything. Like I love music. I love television. I like film. I love my wife. I love my my kids. My cats. You know, it's like I will, I'm easily distracted by all these other things that are really fun because it's sometimes can be really hard work to sit down. And, and that one idea I have, it's just, no matter what you do, even like looking at, say, Borrowing Trouble sitting right there, um, there's a song in there called and I just thought of it was a song called. Um, yeah, there it is. There's a song called Come Back to Bed on that, which was all just music for like years. I had it just the music of it and, and the melody just kind of humming it around for years. And it wasn't until. One day I just sort of sat down and, you know, put my thinking cap on and and wrote the words for it. And then and then it just comes together. It's a song, you know, so so it's it's really that really that balance between that artistic sort of 
moment, plus just putting your hard hat on and start chipping away at it. And I think when you do eight hours of work a day, you're going to write some stuff and it's going to be cool and you're going to write some stuff and it's not going to be cool. And that's just the nature of, I mean, we could talk about how amazing the Beatles are all day long, but there, um, there's a song or two that we're going to both, yeah, that one, that one didn't grab me. You know I mean? That's just because so much of it is a subjective thing, but they also wrote a gazillion songs. So some of them are going to be, you know, the best thing in the world and other ones are just songs, you know? And so I don't think you can be too hard on yourself. And, and that's the one thing is that the most interesting thing about it is my friend Reed Shimizawa from Zucker Baby and I would lock ourselves in studios and just write. We just say, like, we don't want to even come up with a riff. We would just, we literally walk in and be like, okay. And we would walk out at the end of the day with a complete song. Um, that and eventually put out on a thing called TKO. But um, it was, uh, it was really interesting to think like, like at noon today, this song did not exist. And now it's a song, you know what I mean? Yeah. And in some instances, some of those people can take that song and it can change their life. You know what I mean? Like that song will, you know, be uh, on the radio and 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 in a movie or whatever you know and it's like that's that's the beauty of of of, of the magic of, of creating stuff so i think you know there's a lot of kids and, and so many kids just are just naturally talented and and we all hate those people <laughs> you know what I mean? like the people who could just kind of like easily come up with a song or easily come up with a, with a thing and i think that's such a magical thing but it doesn't mean that you know, you can't just sit down and, and, and start working on something and you might surprise yourself. I mean, that's it's it's just literally like just trying to like really put the time in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um going back to this, your your album here, uh, Borrowing Trouble. This mm -hmm. one, there's some there's some static and stereo recorded more acoustic on here. That's and true, yeah. There is there's there's ones I, I can't remember. I think it would be so scandalous, but I could be wrong. Uh, that is recorded with the ukulele. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So I, would that would, just be experimenting that you don't like how it sounds with a, a guitar and you want to try it out or just. It's actually it? it's it's really innocently like someone gave me a ukulele, ukulele for Christmas one year. And I just sort of was. You know, like anything, you learn the first few chords that you know, and the next thing you know, you stumble onto something, and all of a sudden there was a song. It was just kind of one of those magical things where if I had never been given that that instrument, then I never would have come up with that idea. So, um, yeah, that's fun. And I still like when I do acoustic shows, it always comes out and it's it's a big hit. But uh, yeah, the the static and stereo songs and whatnot on that that particular the vinyl version includes the album itself did not have static and stereo songs on it or um i'm trying to think what else on that but yeah what there was an accompanying ep that we put out and we included the, those those ep songs on the vinyl so that included like haunted and heathrow 4am and songs like that that came from static and stereo and a, and a couple other things i can't remember exactly what's on there but yes. so we included it all on the vinyl Ariane, indian, complete, summer. Yeah. indian summer for my solo album in 2004 go time yeah yeah. 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 Cool. Fun stuff. I mean, that's the cool thing with that record to me was I was really going through this phase of Daniel Lanois and the Johnny Cash acoustic records and, and Tom Petty, Wallflowers and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I really always have had a thing for Americana or, you know, and, and so many times in my career, I, I, I started to shift that way, but was always sort of pulled back more into rock. Um. I just always loved the idea of taking an acoustic guitar and hopping on a Greyhound, Greyhound bus and stopping all the way across Canada and through the U.S. just playing shows and making enough money to get to the next town. You know, I always romanticized that idea. So when when the um, uh, the idea came up to do an acoustic record, I just jumped on it. I was like, "This will be a blast!" and uh, you know, you always think it's going to be easier than than it is because you're thinking it's just my voice and a guitar. And you know, oh, we should put some strings on this, or we should do that. You know, and the next thing you know, you're kind of getting carried away. But it was, it was such a liberating and fun thing. I just started doing acoustic shows around Vegas, um, just you know, sort of going. I'm doing this thing. I made a record. Come check it out. And then I would do stuff like um, 
Hello. <laughs> and then I would yeah, do stuff that, like that's the thing with the at home interviews is the dog <laughs> and the kids come in. <laughs> I know, yeah. I'm just shut in my studio here, so uh, otherwise I'd have cats knocking everything over. Um but uh yeah, so you know, just I can't remember exactly what we were on about, but yeah, it's, yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. Um, you said, and, and I wanted to keep this light for my students and stuff, but so, and if you don't want to inter or answer this, this is fine. I was just interesting when you were saying how coming down to the U S earlier was a completely different thing. Um, and, and I'll, I'll preface this with just a quick little story. I was interviewing Neil Osborne, uh, from 5440. 40. Yeah. And he was I'm saying, a big fan. Yeah, like well, they released a whole bunch of albums same, right at, around the same time as uh, oh, yeah, Age yeah. Electric. They're legends, yeah. Yeah, and, and they've got lots of stuff. And what surprised me with what he said was um, that the Canadian music industry is is so much different from the U.S., where the most money from a single thing that they made was when Hootie and the Blowfish covered their song. Uh, I go blind. Yeah, not even like anything that they put out when Hootie and the Blowfish covered it, and, and it's just—I uh, don't know—it's it, surprising to me that I don't know. It, well, that what, also uh, that was on a an episode of Friends. There was a lot of other things that went on with that. So, I mean, when you consider how big the states are, you know, when you com actually consider how many more people live down here, and and all the different radio stations. So, if a song like I go blind playing in Canada, which you will hear probably every day on classic rock in Canada or in some one of the stations, you'll hear a song like that. That many more radio stations down here, plus the Canadian version of Hootie and the Blowfish's cover of I go blind by Food 440, plus the UK or wherever the hell else it's playing. It's just that many more more places have been reached and if neil and i don't know i probably all four guys names might have been attached to it um yeah it's just like we we should all be so lucky you know, I mean? <laughs> you know we're all waiting for someone to do like a version of your song where you're like Ka -ching! Yeah. um but yeah it, it's a fascinating thing and i think that that was the most interesting thing about it was people often say that to me you know and I'm always like, I would never have left Canada. I, not that I ever really, I still feel like I, I, I always have one foot up there, um, even though I haven't been home in over a year now because of COVID. But um, it's it's always that I would never have left if I was lucky enough to have, you know, a, a career that could that could, you know, reach that many more people or even being like a 50 or 40 who was sort of like a heritage band that had that much gigantic catalog and could drive around back and forth, or not drive, but go back and forth across the country and have a great life like that, then I'd say, hell yeah, do it. Um, the benefit of being in a 5442 is the fact that you started a band when you were 23, and then you're, you know, in your 50s or 60s or however old, and you're still in the same band. Like that, yeah. we all wished we had started our Aerosmith or our Kiss or whatever that just kind of lasted forever, but you know, it doesn't always work that way. Um, I suppose Age of Electric was was mine, and it went about 10 years, so that was, you know, that was as long as it was going to go, even though we, we still love each other and still manage to kind of find our way back into each other's lives, um, musically and otherwise. But, um, yeah, it, it's a fascinating thing. And once I came down here, you know, there's a part of me that, like, you know, that wishes I had never, you know, had to leave. Not that I had to leave Canada, but that I, that I kind of... I wish that I could have figured out how to make this all work from there. Um, but then there's a part of me that feels like I should have came down here 20 years earlier. You know what I mean? Just because the opportunity of it all, the, like I said, all the different radio stations and record labels and places to play. And it's just, it's just exponentially that much bigger and, and that much more opportunity, you know? Yeah. Cause it seems like, like lots of bands do that. And I, I don't, hold it against them. I feel like that's where you you go to become your band to become more successful, like walk off the earth, uh, uh, all those type bands uh, kind of move yeah. down to the California area or the LA area to 
try and well, make the name bigger. About that. Yeah, I always think about that with actors. You know, it's like a number of like uh, you'll be surprised how many interviews you'll see with some actor you see on TV and he has an English accent. You're like, whoa. It's like he does an American accent in his Andrew yeah. Lincoln from Walking Dead, people like that. You know, it's sort of like and 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 so people like that will relocate to places like Hollywood because that's where the work is. You know, I mean, that's I'm an actor. I go to Hollywood. I'm a musician. I go to L.A., you know, or whatever it is. Um, you kind of go where stuff is happening. You know, what I mean, and, and that's why otherwise we would have stayed in Saskatchewan as kids. We would have just remained there, but we had to go to Vancouver or Toronto because of what we did uh, for a living uh, in the business. So we chose Vancouver just because, well, that's, it would sort of called us there. And um, so it's, it's very natural, like to, to, if you're going to pursue a career, especially if you want to be like a session type player or that kind of thing, like you, it's one thing if you want to put a band together and, and you guys are called this and we write, you know, then you could be pretty much from anywhere because it's just the same game of like trying to get interest and trying to get, but if you want to be um, a drummer and you want to get work and you can be in studios, well, then you're going to want to go to the studios are, you know I mean? You want to go Nashville, LA, you know, that kind of thing. But that, that, that depends on what your goals are, what your, your end game looks like. It's different for everybody. Yeah. Nice. Um, I think, uh, well, uh, I don't know. Is, is there anything that you think that a new guitar player just kind of sum things up uh, that should work on to get going? Um, you know, it's funny because uh, I went such a roundabout way of playing music and that, um, like, I was sort of like, you know, performing and playing with people before I was really probably ready to be, <laughs> you know, I was kind of like, you know, sort of thrown into the deep end and you kind of learn to swim or drown, you know what I mean? So, um, I think it's all, it's such a case by case basis with this sort of stuff, because I think that everybody, like there are people who are just have that kind of gung ho attitude. And I, sometimes it, it's more about the gung ho attitude than it is about talent. You know, I, I've known a lot of really ambitious, creative people who aren't necessarily that, a lot of people could play circles around them on the guitar or the piano or whatever, but they just happen to be really wired that way to be really creative and really original ideas. And, and that's a big part of it, you know, but it, it all depends on what you want to do. If you want to be a session guitar player, like I, I have friends that play on the SNL band, saying live band or Jimmy Kimmel's band, uh, you know, those kind of things. That's a whole other thing. Like I watch those guys playing and they turn the sheet music and I'm like, well, I'm immediately like not going to get that job <laughs> because I, there's no way I could play that gig. The roots on Jimmy, Jimmy Fallon's show are a little different because they're an actual existing group that he hired. Um, so that's different. Like the idea of being hired as a session musician who can read, that's, if that's how, where you see yourself going, whether it's classical or jazz or whatever, and I say, by all means, chase that down. It wasn't what it wasn't my thing. Like I just never was into that, and never really had that calling. So my whole thing, like I said, that's why I call it street fighting. Is it's all about like, you know, there's there's guys in, in in dojos right now training and learning how to do all this stuff, and all we learned to do was street fight because we just went out there and, and fought. You know what I mean? Musically, there's no fighting going on. <laughs> I would lose that every time. <laughs> but um, you know, and I think that that's you know part of the beauty of music is that is that there's so many different versions of it and so many different um ways to do it that there's no real right way to do it um depending on what you want to do obviously if there's different kinds of music you can't fake you can't you can you can be in a punk rock band and and kind of get around but take that punk rock guy and put him in a jazz band it's not going to fly but sometimes you can't put the jazz player in the punk rock band i've noticed that too so um yeah it's it, it's it's very different i think you know just becoming comfortable on your instrument if you play guitar if you just feel like you're comfortable play with other people it's always good like even listening to the beatles talk about like they'd say stuff like there's a guy over there who knows a b7 chord or something like they would they'd go to meet with another guy because he knew a, a guitar chord they'd never even heard of and i was like what a strange thing that is but this is pre-internet pre you know probably finding a guitar book was probably a challenge you know what I mean? So, right. I mean, we live in a very interesting time because kids can, I'm watching like six-year-olds play Tom Sawyer on the drums. You know what I mean? It's like, because they're, 
everything's so much more available to you in the very format you and I are speaking in. It's kind of like I can go and figure out how to play whatever. You know, if I really want to put my my mind to it, I can learn how to play, you know, you know, some Radiohead song or something like that or whatever. Or I can sit down and learn how to play a Ted Nugent guitar solo, you know, whatever the hell it is. Um, but it's sort of more about, I think eventually people have to figure out what they want to do. If there's anything I could have, wish I would have passed on to myself is it's kind of like stay true to yourself and stay true to what you want to do. If you have a, a vision in mind of what you want to do, like I look at guys like Jack White and I go, I'm sure there's a million people who probably would have said to a guy like Jack White, this is all you're, you're doing this all wrong. You can't do it without a bass player, you know, all those things, you know? And, and I think he just sort of had a vision of what he wanted to do and he made it work and it and worked really well. You know what I mean? So it doesn't mean there's not a million Jack Whites that fall by the wayside, but, um, I just think that that's it's important to kind of have because there's a lot of people along the way who will try and tell you you're wrong and you can't be so strong headed that you just don't take anybody's advice ever. But um, it is important to, uh, to to stick to your what you feel is right. And I think I mean that business wise, I mean, that musically, I mean, that with like the haircut they try to give you, because I've been down every one of these roads, you know, it's like the image they try to force upon you. It's 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 difficult because you're you you look at people in in fancy cars with fancy suits on and, and you go well he clearly knows what he's talking about because he's successful but it doesn't necessarily mean doesn't necessarily mean that he knows what's right for you you know what i mean or what right for what you want to try and accomplish and i think a lot of the the mavericks out there who are doing something doing their own thing i mean prince guys like that there's probably a number of people who probably wanted Prince to, if you would just do this, you would be successful in, in the early days before he was able to really prove himself. And they would have been wrong, you know, and they might have put him in a position where he did something that, you know, wasn't quite right. And he lost his opportunity to really be able to show himself. So, I mean, it's, it's tough. In the age of electric, we thought we had all the answers and we really didn't take any advice from anybody. We really were really obnoxiously very focused on what we wanted to do. Um, and, you know, it worked until it didn't, <laughs> but, uh, that's kind of the, 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 the game, you know what I mean? It's, it's, the it, music should be fun. You know, I think that's what I really try to, to tell everybody is that and people are always like, you always seem so positive and you always, and I'm like, well, because I really enjoy this. You know, I think that if I had gotten, if things hadn't gone the way they, they went and they, and they very easily can, I could be doing a day job and I would still be loving to do this when I can with my friends and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I, I really think that it, it's supposed to be fun and it's supposed to be, you know, uh, it's, it's challenging and it, it should be challenging on occasion because you get too cozy in what you do and then you got to force yourself to kind of try and do something a little different. I play a number of instruments. I try to produce, I try to record, I try to do this and that. So I'm kind of always doing something a little different. Like once I get done with you, I got to finish up some lyrics with a song that I'm working on for a friend. And then I got to get ready for a podcast, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm always doing something that it kind of, and it's always music based usually. And that kind of keeps it fresh. And I don't think there's, there's not a lot of advice anybody would have been able to give me when I was a kid. Like when they start telling you the bad side of the music stuff well it's tough and family and relationships and money and they could have told me every horror story there was and i still would have been like where do where do i sign up like i'm i have my guitar let's do this you know what i mean and, and i think that's kind of the that's kind of the attitude you need because along the way as i'm doing it i watch other guys that were just as passionate about me going like i'm gonna go get married and have a family i'm gonna go to school and become an engineer of, you know, in engineering or something and that kind of stuff, you know, and I just kept going, you know, I just kept, and I don't know if that's really anything commendable. It's kind of almost crazy. Like you should have gotten out a, a long time ago, but you know, I, di I didn't really have a backup plan. And I don't know that as a father, I don't know that I would really be, there's a part of me that's kind of like a backup plan is important, but I think for me, it was more like, uh, it just sort of the path kind of laid itself out. I just started walking down it and it never really ended. It still hasn't. Uh, hopefully somebody will let me know when it's over. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, that seems almost to be like a common theme with a lot of the guitarists that I've interviewed is just that passion and the drive to to keep doing it and to build that resume that you've put together, which is an unbelievable resume. And I, I think oh, wow. that is a key thing that uh, uh, hopefully a, a good takeaway that people take away from these interviews is that. And uh, another thing that you mentioned that I'm, I'm glad you did is about session musicians, because we uh, I don't think anyone in my past interviews have, has mentioned that. And that is a perfectly great uh, way to stay in music and to make some money uh, being in music is through session uh, people hiring you to play drums on their album and things like that. So drummers get all the work. Drummers can be if 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 you ever really notice a really great drummer will be in multiple projects because everybody wants a good solid drummer and everybody even if you're uh, people want to hire that drummer to record on their record because they just want a good solid drummer. So drummers always seem to get a lot of work. If you can, if you can sort of focus yourself that way to be like, um, just kind of able to kind of to shift, shift, shift your your styles a bit, I guess. But always have your thing. I mean, like if you're looking for a Dave Grohl type, then you go, you know, to the guy who plays like Dave Grohl. If you want a jazz guy, you go to a jazz guy. It's kind of like figure out what you do and then just be solid guitar players as well. I mean, like there's a lot of guys that will get called in to, to play on this, play on that singers as a vocalist myself, I would get, I still get not as much as I, cause I don't pursue it as much, but back in the day I used to get hired all the time as a background singer because people make records. They don't want to burn their singer out singing all these harmonies. So they would just have me, as you mentioned with Matt good, come in and just rattle off huh? yeah, third, do the, high, the major third. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Well, what about that fifth below it? Okay. And just like, and you're in there and it's not really art. It's, it's sort of artistic, but it's, it's more like someone tells you what they're looking for. You do it. You walk out the door and, and with a check in hand, hopefully, you know what I mean? And yeah. so again, it, it's all success. If, if you're making music or, or you know, making a living with a guitar in your hand or drumsticks in your hands or the voice God gave you, then, Hey, it's all success. You know, it's, it's all great. Yeah. That's awesome. Who are you? Yeah. You said you were going into uh, the studio in sometime in February. Oh, that's the one we can't talk about. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, we're not, we're not, well, there's a bunch of things going on, but that's one of the ones I'm not really supposed to talk about. So people can build their thing from that. We're, we're, I'm, I'm in so many projects. There's Took, there's uh, Original Sin, which was the original, it was the Sin City Sinners we call it Original Sin now. Uh, Bruce Kulik's band from the he was in Kiss for the non makeup years. We do a side project together. Um, we did a bunch of Kiss cruises and stuff. Um, Slash and the guys. Um, so I do a number of different things. Plus, I'm doing a, I have a project called Minefield that came up during COVID with um, some guys from Ace Fraley's band. We just started writing songs remotely, sending tracks back and forth, and it became a record, and it's great. And uh, wow. you can find that out there too. So. Um, but there's a number of different things that I'm working on. And I'm constantly, and I'm like I say, I'm, I'm constantly kind of co-writing with a, a friend of mine from another thing, and then a, a friend of mine from this other thing. So it's it's kind of like there's always something kind of like on the back burner, and it's always some kind of cooking. So it's it's sort of it keeps me sharp. And I, I've actually been writing more during COVID um, than I have in years because uh, there's nothing else to do. So it's been a lot of like it's all recording, it's all session work it's all tracking it's all writing and i've been singing on tons of projects people send you tracks sing on this great you know, play bass on that great play guitar on this sure uh i really recommend everybody try and get because i'm a neanderthal with the technology but if you know with young people it's like it's so second nature to get into whether it's garage band or pro tools they get so you get so much more out of it if you can if you can do that kind of stuff. And if you can get yourself set up at home, um, then you can do stuff like play on sessions and you know send over a drum track or whatever needs to happen, that kind of thing. So I think if, if you're into music, um, you should cover all your bases as best you can, as long as you love it. I, I'm not a technology guy, and I, it drives me crazy. But I try to get myself to a point where you need me to sing something, I can do that. You need me to play bass on something, I can do that. Um, I don't really want to get too far into a bunch of other stuff because, um, I just, 
know so many people who were just like so much more prepared to do that. And I'd rather do it with them. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you so much. I, I said that it was only going to be up to a half hour and we're probably reaching like an hour mark here. So I apologize oh, for that. Uh, I should but, be the one apologizing. I, 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 I'm never short-winded with these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. And I, uh, what I'm probably going to, I have a really good performance of, I, I've got a couple of them. I want to put one with you with Slash. And then obviously I want to put one of Age of Electric. And my sure. principles are gearing me to, to I wanted to put a, a performance of you guys playing Ugly, but they... Uh, really want me to post uh, remote control. So sure. I found a good one of you and Ryan playing on a, another radio station in 2017, which is oh, sure. all acoustic, which is pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm going to put all those with these and hopefully it can inspire some of my students to maybe take up a career with music kind of similar. Well, they should. I mean, it, it always stops me dead in my tracks when I think I grew up in a small town, like 1500 people, no street lights, no McDonald's, no Seven Eleven. you know, outside of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. So the big city itself is still a relatively small place. You know what I mean? Like, so but, you know, I, I was, you know, we're just watching a movie last night. I was watching Gladiator on TV going like, I have been to the Rome, Roman Coliseum. You know what I mean? Like, I have been there twice, you know. And it, it's one of those things where when you're from a little tiny town, um, it's sort of, and I, I started doing all these talks with musician friends myself and started playing them because I always love hearing the story because everybody's story is the same way. Even if you grew up in Hollywood, it doesn't mean that you're just, that much closer to being uh, successful it just means you know you're just that much closer to hollywood but I, I really always feel like it doesn't really matter where you're from the beatles are from liverpool that may as well be i don't know take your pick you know it's like london is london and all that other stuff man even manchester is like you know but liverpool is like this kind of like you know no one would have thought like that's where the best thing in the entire world is going to come from this little place in northern england um, and Elvis was from Tupelo, Mississippi. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it's, it, so we kind of kind of get into our heads that like, because I grew up in, in small town Saskatchewan, that this is never going to happen for me. It's ridiculous to even consider it, but it is, it is, anything is possible. That's the one thing I have learned. You know, when I have been to Tokyo, I've been to Moscow, I've been all over the world. And I'm not saying this stuff to kind of brag. I'm saying that Everything is attainable if you just sort of like really are ready to throw yourself into it, you know, what I mean, and, and really kind of pursue it because I have, you know, I live in when I'm especially in Hollywood and, and Los Angeles, so many Canadians down there who have pursued their dreams and pursued what they want to do. Um, it's a it's a big ask and it's a big jump to to move to another country in general. You just can't just move. It's a whole thing. Um but even moving to Toronto or moving to Vancouver, it's like one of those places where it's a thing and there's a scene. I'm not saying you have to move. I'm not actually one of those guys. I really do believe that you, you can be from wherever you're from and make a really good career for yourself. Um, but, you know, I'm just trying to point out that I was from nowhere, dude. <laughs> there was no there's no way I should have been able to do any of this. But it's just the way it works if you kind of really throw yourself in. I don't have an I don't have a backup plan. <laughs> so it's kind of like. This is the backup plan. You know, this. I feel like you're set. You you're okay well, set. <laughs> from your lips to God's ears. Let's let's hope so. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> well, thanks, man. That was really fun. Yeah, that was awesome. Thanks so much. I'm gonna make sure to hit stop on here so it doesn't screw up before anything happens. <laughs>